next song is our last song before communion. And what I love most about this song is it's sung from God's perspective. A lot of worship songs are sung from our perspective. But this is about God saying that his son's name is highly exalted. Let's join in worship.
walking among us on earth, dying on the cross, and raising from the dead that gives us resurrection power. Holy God, be exalted in this place. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all you've done for us, Lord Jesus. May your name be highly exalted in our hearts. In Jesus' name. Today, I, I want to talk about forgiveness. And... Um, I just want to make this statement. I don't want you to forget this statement. It's at the very beginning. Forgiveness is a reflection of our relationship with God. Forgiveness is a reflection of our relationship with God. Okay, so lock that in some, somewhere in your brain. Okay, because this is important. This is something that I don't know if you noticed... And if you haven't yet, I don't know why, but having relationships with people is very difficult. And people will let you down. And people will hurt you. Yet, we're called to forgiveness. And it starts with our relationship with God. It doesn't start with the relationship with each other. Okay? All right, so we're going to look at uh, Joseph, and many of you know the story of Joseph. Um, Joseph's brothers, if you don't know the story, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. And, and many, many years earlier when we, when we look at the story, but Joseph ended up in an Egyptian prison, and, but was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream, one of Pharaoh's dreams, or actually many of Pharaoh's dreams, but um, one that was important is that Egypt actually made policy decisions based on this interpretation of Pharaoh's dream that Joseph made. Okay, so Joseph had an impact. You know, God gave Pharaoh the dream, but Joseph is the one that interpreted it, gave it back to Pharaoh, and then he made policy decisions. And because of that policy decision, they had enough food for the famine that came, right, after seven years, those that know the story. And it saved not only the Egyptians, but foreigners, such as Joseph's family. Remember his brothers that sold him into slavery? Well, they ended up in Egypt so that they would not starve to death. And Joseph's brothers really were at his mercy. Joseph, you know, Joseph's at this level, and his brothers are, well, you can't see because this is the level they're at, all right, in Egypt, frankly. They sold him into slavery, but now he had power in the land. And he had power over them. He could have went, you're done. That's the kind of power that I believe he had. So let's look at the text here. This is, this is after uh, they've been there for a while, and now Jacob, Joseph, and his brother's father died. All right, so Genesis 15, uh, 50, 14 through 21. After burying Jacob... Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brother became, brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. Hmm, maybe. So they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died... He instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, meaning the brothers, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. But Joseph replied, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended harm to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them. And now I think given the story, Joseph had a right to be angry with his brothers. Isn't it pretty obvious? I mean, anyone here be angry if your siblings sold you into slavery? 
yeah, yeah, I, I'd be a bit, you know, we, I'd be a bit put out. You know, that's the, I'd be a bit angry with, with, um, with my brothers. And even though Joseph, you know, he kind of deserved it. And it's, I mean, well, he didn't deserve it, but in their mind at the beginning, they might have thought he did. He had a mouth on him, meaning he was pretty prideful, but he didn't deserve to be sold into slavery. Okay, so he was slow, um, sold into slavery, um, but, and they knew, they knew that they were dependent on Joseph's heart, his forgiveness. Their status was dependent on his forgiveness. But then their, their dad, Jacob, died, and which in their minds, it put their status into question. It's all about relationship, right? You know, so, okay, dad's dead. Now what's our brother going to do? Verse 14, let's look at that again. After burying Jacob, Joseph returned to Egypt with his brothers and all who had accompanied him to his father's burial. But now that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers became fearful. Now Joseph will show his anger and pay us back for all the wrong we did to him, they said. <clears throat> Note something. They weren't sure that Joseph forgave them. They'd been there for years, and they still didn't know if Joseph forgave them. Or that their relationship really was restored. This says, I think, much about the character of the brothers. You know, like how they think. To have this sort of question in their mind, even after these years, they're still wondering. It says something about the character of these guys. My experience has taught me that those that think I might be treacherous are really the ones that are capable of treachery themselves, all right? So I'm looking at these brothers with a little bit of, hmm, suspicion, all right? Um, and this is kind of a harsh assessment on my part, uh, but I, then I step back and I realize something, that there are many of us, many people, that are uncertain of God's forgiveness, they wander around and wondering if God really has forgiven them. They, they won't, they, they have a difficult time crossing that threshold into, yeah, I am fully forgiven because of what God has done. You know, God finished the work, not me. I have just accepted it. So I go, okay, a little kinder to his brothers, and I understand that's a human condition is whether or not we really can accept that we're forgiven, even by God, even when he promises that he's forgiven us. So the, his brothers act on their fear, and we read, so they sent this message to Joseph. Before your father died, he instructed us to say to you, please forgive your brothers for the great wrong they did to you, for their sin in treating you so cruelly. So we, the servants of the God of your father, beg you to forgive our sin. When Joseph received the message, he broke down and wept. Then his brothers came and threw themselves down before Joseph. Look, we are your slaves, they said. I'm going to tell you, it's interesting because the Bible never ever records that Jacob had told the brothers, you know, when I die, make sure to go to Joseph and say that I told you and that you want, I want Joseph to forgive you guys. It doesn't add up, does it? <laughs> Why wouldn't J Jacob just go to Joseph and say, please forgive them? So you, you see, when we're uncertain about forgiveness, how we begin to work really hard. And, and in this situation, I think, not everyone agrees with me, I think these guys were lying. <laughs> I think they were just saying, well, we got to come up with something so that Joseph says that he forgives us. You know, first of all, we, let's remember, first of all, we don't need to do this with God. God already knows who we are in our condition. All right. We don't need to try to broker a deal with God. He knows us. We just need to accept his forgiveness. The other issue I have with the brothers is simply this. They were trying to rely on the status of his father, of their father, instead of relying on the character of their brother. 
They were trying to rely on the status of their father than the character of their brother. How, do we, how many times do we do that? We negotiate again with a mediator between us and God instead of really accepting the character of God and who he is. We put somebody before. We put some activity before. Whatever you want to call it. Instead of Joseph having the character to forgive his brothers and to be trustworthy. It's difficult, though, for us. When we have wronged somebody, we always may have that sense of, did they really forgive us? Are we really reconciled? Um, I'm trying to personally figure out just how remorseful these guys were. You know, were they really remorseful? They're, they're lying. They're trying to do whatever they can. So how bad did they really feel? I think, you know, did they feel remorseful or were they just scared for their own skin? Again, I'm just being a suspicious guy. But don't we sometimes, we sometimes qualify others, meaning we, quali- we, we go, are, are you really, should I forgive you? Are you qualified to be forgiven? Are you remorseful enough? Yeah. I didn't mean to get some, some chuckles. I heard some chuckles there. I think I'm identif- people are identifying with this. Because we're not called, we are not called to do that. We are not called to judge somebody else's remorsefulness around whether or not we forgive them. That's, I don't know about you, that's difficult for me. There are times when that's difficult for me. I wonder if Joseph had these same questions and how he judged their level of sorrow. And then I I think, well, if Joseph had these questions, his answer to them shows that, like I just said, an assessment of remorse is not relevant in our our interpersonal relationships. How many like this message so far? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Here's Joseph's reply. Don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Now, if this was recorded just as he said it, I am really amazed at Joseph. Because if I had been Joseph, I would have said, well, you know, even though I got put in prison by this woman who tried to, you know, seduce me, and I was doing the right thing, and I got in prison for, how long was Joseph in prison? Seven years? And more. More. Thirteen years, right? 13 years? Because remember, the, the baker and the but, butler, you know, and he inter, inter, interpreted the dream, and he, you know, remember me. So I would have made sure the brothers heard all this story <laughs> before he got to this point. But he didn't. This is the character of this man. He said, God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Remember this, the the policy decision. It was based on Joseph's interpretation of the dream. If he had not been there, who knows what would have happened. No, don't be afraid. I will continue to take care of you and your children. So he reassured them by speaking kindly to them and asking, am I God? Joseph is illustrating this un, his own understanding of his place. Like we need to understand our place. He is not the judge. We are not the judge. He has deferred to God. God makes those decisions. Our relationships with others, friends or enemies is really determined, and I'm going to say it again like I said at the beginning, it's our relationships with friends or enemies is determined and regulated by our relationship with God. 
It all begins with God in our relationship with God. The ability to forgive comes from God's forgiveness of us. If we do not know our need for forgiveness from God and that we have been forgiven, we won't forgive others. Our willingness to forgive is evidence. It's evidence of our own choice to seek and receive forgiveness from God. That's when we really know we understand forgiveness from God is when we're able to forgive others. It's difficult. Joseph goes on to say that even though they intended to harm him, God intended these events for good. God brought me to the position, this position, so I could save the lives of many people. So not only, not only does Joseph understand his place with God, He also understands the God that he serves is a good God. He works things out. We we, many of us know that verse in Romans. You know, he works things out for those that love him. He works things out for good. Keith paraphrase. Okay. None of us. None of us. Give ourselves the freedom to forgive as God wants us to if we don't believe that God has good intentions for us. I want to say that again. None of us are able to really forgive as God wants us to if we don't really believe that God has good intentions for us. You know, think about being bound up being pulled behind, I don't know if it's donkeys or camels, not sh- sure where he's going. He's, he's Joseph. I'm sure he's angry, and then he's there, and, and he gets in prison. And at some point, he ha- if he really believes in God, he's like, God has something good. God has something good. Do we have that sort of trust and faith in that kind of God? No matter what the circumstances look like, no matter who is hurting us, that we trust God, that he has something good for this. Again, I understand. This is a tall order. really is a tall order. Because Joseph's relationship with God was right, Joseph was able to have a right attitude towards his brothers. There's no way he could have a right attitude towards his brothers apart from having actually wrestled and struggled and finally coming to a right understanding of God and his goodness. And like this is difficult. Now, understand, he did not gloss over what they had done. He didn't just ignore it. He, he did say, you intended to harm me. Okay? It's not all like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you intended to harm me is what he says. We still need to speak the truth. It's necessary. It's good. But holding on to the anger that comes along sometimes with that truth is not good. Releasing anger means giving up something. It does mean we have to humble ourselves. To, to, because the anger, I don't know, every time I'm angry, I think I'm right. I'm right to be angry. <laughs> it's my right to be angry. And I have to humble myself and say, you know what? It's not. I need to humble myself. Joseph said in humility, I will take care of you. Joseph said, I will take care of you. Not because you deserve it, but because I serve God. Amen. I don't know all of your stories, and some of you have experienced pain that would match the betrayal and helplessness that Joseph went through at the hands of his brothers. And even if you haven't, it's understood that the actual event of being wronged is not as powerful as what one's perception of the event is. What offends me may not offend you. What offends you may not offend me. It's just the condition of our hearts and our minds. 
I want to ask Tunic to come on up here and uh, Ramina. And uh, <clears throat> Tunic has a wonderful story of forgiveness. And so I just want her to share and uh, I'll give you a, you can just grab that microphone there. Any mic work okay, Naveen? Yeah, good. So. Всем привет. Я бы хотела немножко... Hello, everyone. <laughs> Меня зовут Тунык, я учусь здесь в христианском университете. My name is Tunik. I am studying here in Christian University. И я хочу немножко вот рассказать предысторию. And I will tell the story that happened before that. У меня с детства отношения с отцом были очень близкими и очень доверительными. Since childhood, I had very trustworthy and very close relationship with my father. И по мере моего взросления я где-то в подростковом возрасте начала ходить в церковь. And uh, when I became a teenager, I started going to church. Ну, моя семья неверующая. И когда мой отец об этом узнал, он был очень зол и был очень против, чтобы я ходила в церковь. So my family is not Christian. And when my father found out that I started going to church, he was very angry about that. И потом, чтобы избежать этого запрета, я утром рано вставала и уходила в церковь, пока все спали. And he would not let me go to church, but I would go really early in the morning to go to church. И когда уже я приняла решение, что хочу следовать за Христом, то мой отец был ну, прям очень-очень зол. And when I gave my life to Jesus, my father was really angry. И с этого момента мои отношения с отцом начали очень быстро ухудшаться. So since then, my relationships with him went worse and worse. И когда я еще принял решение, что хочу приехать сюда, чтобы учиться, и когда он узнал, что это христианский университет, то это было просто конец наших отношений с ним. So when I decided to come to Moldova and when my father found out that it's a Christian university, that was the end of the relationship. И он поставил меня под выбором, под вопросом и сказал мне. So he uh, put a choice in front of me and he told me. Если ты уедешь в Молдову, то можешь не возвращаться. So if you go to Moldova, you don't need to come back. И сказал то, что можешь считать, что у тебя больше нет отца, а я буду считать, что у меня нет больше дочери. So, and you don't need to think that you have a father anymore, and I have no daughter. И было очень больно слушать от отца такие слова, потому что у нас никогда не было с ним таких конфликтов, тем более таких масштабов. And it was very painful to hear that because we never had such serious conflicts with my father. И также так получилось, что были еще и другие возникли, как сказать, другие обиды на моего отца, так как больше семейные драмы, из-за которой я очень тоже начала злиться на моего отца и думала, как ты можешь злиться, осуждать меня, когда ты сам виноват тоже. And uh, after that, some family dramas happened, and I, w I became more upset with him. And I thought, how can he judge me when he is doing also bad things? No, и на его вопрос, как на его, я выбрала, конечно, своего небесного отца. And of course, uh, after he gave me this choice, I chose my heavenly father. И даже когда я уезжала um, из дома, то он даже со мной не попрощался. And when I left my home, my father did not even came to tell me goodbye. Было очень тяжело сюда ехать, но я знала, что um, небесный отец он никогда от меня не откажется, и он всегда будет рядом со мной. It was very hard to leave, but I always knew that my heavenly father will take care of me, and he will never leave me alone. И когда я была на первом курсе, я получила откровение, что мой отец будет uh, служителем для Бога, и что его сердце будет биться для Христа. Year, God, will give, will и тогда я подумала и говорю, М -м, Боже, это что-то на моего отца совсем не похоже. Потому что мой отец, он вообще не хотел слушать 
ни слова о Боге, о Христе, потому что он считал меня предательницей своей веры, так сказать. И на протяжении всего времени, что я нахожусь здесь, мы ни разу не общались, и я понимала, что я на него злюсь, и что я должна его простить, но я говорила Богу, Боже, дай мне немножко права позлиться, пообижаться, я прощу его, но не сейчас. And since I was here, I never talked to my father, and I was very upset, and I held unforgiveness, but I said to God, I know I need to forgive, but just give me time, and let me be angry for a while, and then the time will come. И потом я понимала, что я его прощаю, думала, что я его простила, и когда um, у меня было несколько попыток наладить с ним отношения, когда я ему писала или звонила, он мне просто не отвечал, просто игнорировал меня. И я такая, значит так, то я тебя тоже не прощаю. И Um, после этого Бог очень много работал с моим сердцем. Мне было очень тяжело принять решение простить его, потому что когда я каждый раз думала о наших отношениях, я начинала злиться, и я понимала, что я еще не готова простить, и я его еще не простила. В канун Нового года, это было в декабре. So around New Year in December. Um, я думала, что нужно восстановить свои отношения с Отцом. Я очень много думала о своих отношениях с моим Небесным Отцом. So I thought I should restore my relationships with my Father, and I was thinking about my relationships with my Heavenly Father. И я очень много молилась, я понимала, что Бог меня простил, и я тоже должна прощать. И в одну из новогодних ночей я просто ночью не могла уснуть и думала об этом. И Дух Святой, Он побудил меня, чтобы я написала письмо своему отцу. And Holy Spirit uh, provoked me to write a letter to my father. И я просто начала писать очень такое длинное сообщение, и я говорила своему папе, что то, что я его люблю, то, что Бог его любит, и то, что я его прощаю, так как Бог меня простил, и Бог готов простить его тоже. И попросил у него тоже прощения. So I wrote a long, long letter of uh, me saying that I love him and that God loves him and that God forgave us, so I forgive him as well. И со спокойным сердцем я уснула. So, and I sent it and I fell asleep peacefully. На следующее утро я получила ответное письмо от отца за все три года. So, for the first time in three years, my father replied after that. И он сказал, что он тоже очень меня сильно любит и ждет меня. И сказал спасибо, что я его прощаю, и тоже попросил у меня прощения. И с тех пор мои отношения с отцом начали больше налаживаться, и все эти утраченные годы на протяжении вот трех лет мы... Сейчас это все наверстываем и общаемся каждый день. And since then our relationship started restoring and we talk more and more and I feel like we are recovering what we missed in these three years. И каждый, каждое утро, вы не поверите, каждое утро он uh, пишет мне доброе утро, солнышко, доброе and... утро и желает мне хорошего дня. И потом пишет мне Хорошего дня тебе, спокойной ночи и много-много чего хорошего. So and you probably won't believe, but like every morning he writes me, good morning sunshine, have a good day, have a good evening. <laughs> да, и это очень сильно меня радует, и я очень благодарна Богу, что Он контролирует все сферы моей жизни, несмотря на все трудности, которые я прохожу, я знаю, что Он всегда со мной. 
And it brings me a lot of joy because I realize that God has in control all the situations in my life and uh, he will bring it for good. Да, и перед где-то в начале недели, когда я думала, что я буду говорить, я видела сон и во сне было то, что когда я рассказывала свое свидетельство здесь, я видела своего отца где-то сидящего вот здесь и слушающего мое свидетельство. Я не знаю, это был просто сон, но это очень сильно ободрило меня. And uh, in the beginning of the week, when I was thinking that I'm going to share my testimony, I had a dream, and in this dream I saw that while I'm sharing my testimony, my father is in the audience. It was just a dream, but it was so encouraging for me. Затем я вспомнила о том пророчестве, которое я получила, когда я здесь была первый год обучения, что мой отец он будет служить для Бога, и сейчас это пророчество для меня больше как не что-то из области фантастики, что-то реальное, и я верю, что это время еще настанет. So and then I remember the prophecy that I've got that my father will be the man of God, and now I totally believe it, and I can see that it might happen. И я знаю, что у большинства есть неверующие родители, может быть, это один из них верующий, а другой нет, или другие члены семьи, которые еще не познали Бога. And I know that many of you probably have unbelievers parents or one of them is not a believer or any other family members that didn't come to Christ yet. И я просто хочу вас ободрить то, что чтобы вы продолжали за них молиться и верю то, что Бог свое время даст плоды того, что вы о чём вы молитесь. And I just uh, encourage you to pray and that uh, God will take care of it and he will bring fruits of your prayer. It's the same story, isn't it? Genesis 50, Joseph and his brothers, Tunic and her father. It's the same story. <laughs> 